Tell you what, I'm half tempted to just throw out my notes and tell the uh, lipstick lady story for John. For those of you who've heard it before, I'm sure you remember it, it's a great one. Um, thanks, John. I'm here tonight uh, as a proud member of the Bank of America corporate team. Uh, I'm also from the North Carolina chapter, and uh, it has to be said, I'm a proud alum of the National Capital Area chapter. But that's, that's the end. I'm here for Goofy. Uh, I'm excited about that. This will be my third Goofy. At some point I'll learn not to do that anymore. Um, but that's, none of that's why I'm here. Why I'm here is back in January of 2005, so about eight years ago, I was diagnosed with follicular lymphoma. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of science, but then we'll get past that and be done. Lymphoma is a blood cancer. You've probably heard that a few times. So with me, follicular lymphoma, it's, it's uh, at some point in my life, a B-cell lymphocyte in my body went haywire. And what that means is it just keeps reproducing itself and it's lost its ability to kill itself. All of your cells are programmed to kill themselves. But it, this one did not. And all of the cells that it produces also do not have the ability to kill themselves. So what happens when you have a blood cancer like that those cells start to crowd out healthy cells, and that's when you need to get treatment, hopefully kill off the useless cells. But obviously there are people that lose their battle because the, the cancerous cells crowd everything else out, and unfortunately we don't have a cure. There are basically two types of blood cancers. There's an aggressive type, it's as it sounds when you are diagnosed. Uh, if you're in a hospital setting, they may not even let you leave the hospital. You will go immediately into treatment. The good news about aggressive blood cancers, if there is such a thing about good news, is that they can be cured. It depends on the individual, it depends on a lot of factors, but you can be cured. You can be put into remission and after five years of remission you'll be declared cured. Obviously there are uh, a lot of folks that don't make that point and they'll find out relatively quickly how well they're going to do in the treatment because it is a very fast growing disease. What I have is called an indolent type of blood cancer. And an indolent lymphoma is a very slow growing disease. So with me, I could have had it for years and not known. And it's likely that I will have it for many more years and hopefully it won't give me too many more problems. The bad news about an indolent lymphoma is it's not curable. What they can do is they can put you into remission, but it's almost certain that you will have a relapse. And what the goal is, is to just keep putting you into remission, but at some point, usually those treatments will fail. Now, that's not necessarily the case anymore. When I started talking about this eight years ago, that was relatively true. Nowadays, because of the research dollars that have been put in, on an indolent lymphoma, they're thinking that maybe it can be more of a chronic condition where, yes, you need treatment, they can give it to you, at some point it will fail, but because they've got so many other treatments that they've developed, they'll just switch the treatment over to something else and start the cycle over again. We'll see. I'd much rather have a cure, but I'll take a chronic condition over something else any day. So with me, what happened was I didn't really have symptoms of, of lymphoma. Um, what happened was actually I had jaundice. Uh, jaundice is when your eyes turn yellow, your skin gets a little dark, there are other symptoms of jaundice that aren't all that polite to discuss, certainly not while you're eating food, so I won't share those, but suffice it to say, I knew something was wrong. And like anybody else, I decided I didn't need to see a doctor because I've got Google. <laughs> so I Google jaundice. And when you Google jaundice, you'll see that jaundice is usually caused by gallstones. So I go to the doctor. I help him out with the diagnosis a little bit. Don't need to waste time with tests. I've got gallstones. Let's go. <laughs> Slow down, buddy. We're going to do some tests. So, I go get a sonogram because they need to confirm that it's gallstones. We do the sonogram. The radiologist can clearly see something is wrong, but there are no gallstones. At that point, I thought the people at Google really needed to get their act together. <laughs> Maybe they have by now. I don't know. But at that point, the doctor said, look, if it's not gallstones, it's something that's serious, okay? We don't, you know, if it's not gallstones, then there's something else going on, and we need to admit you for tests. And so I'm in the hospital, 
going through a lot of tests, imaging, some fairly invasive stuff, and it leads up to, we need to do some fairly radical surgery. We think that you have a tumor in your body that's essentially acting like a gallstone would. It's blocking up some plumbing between your liver and your small intestine, and we need to go in and see what's going on. So I had the surgery. That was January 8th, 2005, so that was a little over eight years ago. It was a pretty radical surgery. Um, I went into the hospital weighing about 205. Two weeks later, I came out weighing 167. So that's about 40 pounds in two weeks. Now, that's what happens when you don't eat for two weeks, because I wasn't allowed to eat. But it's also what happens when your body is frantically trying to repair itself because of you know, what was done to it. So I wake up in the recovery room. I don't really remember much about it. Apparently there were conversations, people talked to me, I don't recall them. What I do recall is the next day on the 9th, I was lying in ICU, and it's about, I'm gonna guess it's about six in the morning, at the latest. And there are, there's a doctor on rounds with what I think were probably medical students. You think we're gonna get up early to run these races? I don't know when these medical students sleep. And I can assure you that the people in the hospital don't want the patients to get any sleep because they're in and out at all hours. But I hear the doctor outside my door explaining to the medical students my case. You know, just sort of going over, here's Mr. Kaufman, blah, blah, blah. I have no idea who the doctor was. It wasn't my doctor. Um, he never came in the room. But that was the first time I ever heard a doctor say I had lymphoma. So that was January 9th. That was, again, almost eight years, a little over eight years ago. I didn't really know what it meant. I was too out of it to really have much of a reaction. Uh, but that's the first time I had heard it. Now, the funny thing about an indolent lymphoma is you don't go into treatment right away. You don't have to, I should say. And so I wasn't showing symptoms of cancer. I was showing symptoms of jaundice. So the doctors confirmed, yes, you have lymphoma. Now go home until you feel sick. When you feel sick, come back and we will treat you. And I was thinking, what? You're telling me I have cancer and I, and I get to go home and I don't ever have to call you until I feel sick? Ex excuse me, what? And they're like, no, look, if you have an indolent lymphoma, nowadays we don't even treat it until you start showing symptoms. Okay. Um, I got cancer, I'll just go home and hang out, sure. Um, so I went home, I, it, I was home for about six weeks before I went back to work. It was a pretty boring time, um, sitting at home doing nothing for six weeks. And so by this time it's the end of January. And I decided I got nothing else to do, I might as well do my taxes, right? So I'm doing my taxes and I'm looking through my deductions from the prior year, right? And I see that in 2004, I had written a $25 check to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. I'm thinking, was this a sign? You know, did I, did I kind of know maybe I had lymphoma? I don't know, and, and if I did, why was it only $25? Because <laughs> I'm gonna need more help than that, right? Um, and I was trying to think, why did I write this check for $25? Because the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, wasn't a, it wasn't a chapter my wife and I supported, but then it dawned on me, uh, a work colleague of mine had done team and training, and she did what we've all done, which is blast an email to anybody that you know asking for money, and I sent her a check. And so there I am in January at home, barely functioning, and I thought to myself, when I get up back on my feet, I want to look into this team and training thing and see what it's all about. So I signed up for my first half marathon, which was 2005, it was the Virginia Beach half with team and training. It was great, loved it. But towards the end of the training, that's when I started showing symptoms of the lymphoma. So at this point, I'm, hey doc, I'm back. That was fine, but I also wanted to run a full marathon. So I signed up for the Disney marathon, the 2006 Disney marathon. That was the first marathon I was gonna do. So right as the fall season was ending and the winter season was beginning, you know, it, at that point my doctor and I had to figure out what are we going to do. 
I started having night sweats. I started having fevers literally every 10 days. You can set your calendar by it. Every 10 days I would have a fever. And my doctor's like, you know, maybe we should do, let's do some treatment. And, and those of you who've gone through the training will relate to this because I looked at him and I said, but I'm kind of training for a marathon. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put that off. <laughs> and he looks at me, he's like, you kind of have cancer. <laughs> Maybe you ought to get treated first. Now, that's actually not how it happened at all. Um, makes for a good line, makes me look like a tough guy. I don't need treatment, I'm running a marathon. Um, but what actually happened, just to show you where we're going with the research, the doctor said, look, as long as you can tolerate the symptoms, we don't need to treat you. And if you can hang on for another month, we have a clinical trial opening that you are perfect for. I said, all right, I'm gonna hang on for another month. So I hang on for a month and I start the clinical trial. The clinical trial involved a combination of two antibodies. Antibodies are things that grow in your body. You use them to fight infections. You use them to fight disease. The problem with cancer is your body's immune system doesn't recognize the cancerous cells as being foreign, so it doesn't attack them. With these antibodies, the antibodies that they give you through an IV, they glom on to those cells that are causing problems, and only those cells, those types of cells. And it either, by glomming on, it kills the cell, or it causes your immune system to kill the cell. So unlike chemotherapy, which is like setting off a bomb in your body, and literally you just try to outlive the treatment before the cancer dies, this is very targeted and there are no side effects. Every Tuesday in November of 2005, I went in and got treatment. Think about what you were doing in November when you were training. If you were doing a half marathon, you're probably doing six, eight, ten miles for your long runs. Full marathon, what, 12, 14, 16, maybe even 18 miles? I was doing that too. I'd go in and get my IV on Tuesday, I'd drive myself home, run Wednesday morning, and I'd run the long run on Saturday. No side effects. This hairline is not caused by treatment. This is what I live with every day. That's just good genes, is what that is. It's pretty phenomenal. If you look at where we've come, you know, how well we've done because of all the fundraising that we've done. I mean, we've all, when we're doing the fundraising, we all get the question, right? You're gonna do what? You're gonna, you're gonna run how far? Why, why would you do that? I, I, don't, I don't drive that far. I mean, what's, what's wrong with you? Well, how long do you have? Um, but the bottom line is, you know, you do it, hopefully, you're doing it with this team because you can. I mean, that's why I do it. But then I think about it, I used to say I do it because I can. But the more I thought about it, the more it's actually the flip side. It's actually the flip side of that argument, or that statement, I guess. I, I do it because there are others who can't. Right, we've all heard stories by now. Unfortunately, there are a lot of folks in this room who have loved ones who have been affected by this. We saw the slideshow at the beginning. A lot of in-memory pictures up there. And I just want to bring this point home, if I could. This is Samantha Zeichuk Collins. Samantha was diagnosed with AML acute myelogenous leukemia on April 25th, 2011. She underwent a lot of chemo. She went through a stem, a stem cell transplant, which is perhaps the most grueling treatment that they could design for cancer. She fought, okay? But on January 25th, almost a year ago, she lost her battle. She left behind two kids and a husband. This is unacceptable. This is why I run. Hopefully this is why all of you are running. 
and we're going to have a tough time out there this weekend. Undoubtedly, we will have hard times, whether it's mile two or mile 20. But if we have the ability to draw on her strength, to draw on the strength of people who've gone through this, if we have just an ounce, a fraction of the strength that they have shown, we're going to do fine. Before I go, I just want to, I want to thank you guys. You guys have been thanked a million times. I want to be the million and first. The funds that you've raised have led to significant advances like the treatment that I went through. I mean, if we can treat cancer and let somebody train for a marathon at the same time, we're making progress. We, talk, we heard John say a little bit ago that it'd be great to be at the final inspiration dinner. I can promise you I will be there for that one. I want to put team and training out of business. And not because it's not a great program. I've been here 14 times. I love it. But I'm tired of hearing stories like Samantha's. And to be selfish for a minute, Lord knows I don't want to be a story that's told in a couple of years. Look, it gets said so often, it, it, it just bounces off your ears, and it sounds trite, but it's true. Everyone in this room is a hero. Know that. Remember that tomorrow or Sunday or both, when you hit the wall, when you run into trouble, remember why you're here. You are a hero. So thank you. Good luck this weekend and go team.